that's looking at how we challenge the dominant narrative uh, and that she has also been a friend of the social studies ed program at the University of Maryland for a long time in a variety of contexts. So um, with no further ado, we'll jump into our presentation, giving a little bit of information about the background of the Library of Congress grant that enabled us to do this work. So uh, in collaboration with Dr. Magdalena Gross, who is a former University of Maryland professor who has since relocated back to California, we decided that we wanted to uh, take on a project that allowed us to take an informed process for developing teacher resources, specifically lesson plans, that would allow teachers to uh, address the difficult history. And after doing a, a review of a variety of topics, we decided to focus on enslavement, uh, knowing that this was a subject that is very uncomfortable and difficult for some teachers to tackle. Uh, and that we knew after a review of the textbooks that uh, are most common for teaching US history in particular, that the textbooks uh, were very narrow and limiting in the uh, narrative that it provided. And so, as a result of that review, we decided to focus that um, this project on dealing with enslavement in Maryland, uh, knowing that this would be a great way to partner with our local school systems that we um, partner with on a regular basis for our internship experience. And so we started with uh, looking for primary sources within the Library of Congress. We had a team of faculty who did that and just uh, sat within the library, both um, physically as well as online and scoured the resources focusing on enslavement uh, as well as enslavement in Maryland. We were two graduate students who helped to develop a series of lesson plans and then met with a team of experts, uh, of course, from the University of Maryland, and that's how Dr. Murray became involved in the project, but as well as from Stanford, Brown, Harvard, Chapel Hill, who came and spent some time doing a careful review of what we had developed and giving feedback for revision and change that then resulted in updated and revised materials. We also spent some time uh, developing a teacher pre-service, uh, really focused, uh, excuse me, uh, professional development for pre-service teachers, uh, as well as a public facing website. And the reason I spend the time just explaining the process is, is to just to highlight just uh, the complex work that goes into tackling it, but also looking for ways that we can provide some transferable skills that teachers in the field can utilize when tackling the difficult history as well, or difficult issues. So thank you, Allison. And again, I just wanted to say thank you for involving me on this panel. I have great connections with uh, Barbara Freelander, who heads this network, and she's just lovely to work with in our context in Montgomery County Public Schools. And like uh, Allison stated, we've known each other since middle school when I transitioned her from being the eighth grade president, and she became and took over me at SCA. So it's, it's like Maryland um, history and love. So it was a joy to work with Allison on this project. And we grounded this project in the conceptual framework of what is difficult history. And, and as a social studies educator, I can't imagine a more interesting time to be in this work and thinking about these difficult histories. And what do, what do we think of as a difficult history? We think of it as central to our nation's history. Um, we think uh, that it's refutes broadly accepted version of key narratives. So my work as a social studies educator center, centers around the teaching of the civil rights movement. Um, and so that connects uh, obviously with the, the larger role of enslavement in our country um, are relevant uh, um, and often include violence. So when we look at some of these difficult histories and we, and we conceptualize them as they are understood in the K through 12 setting, these are the histories that sort of challenge teachers around their pedagogy. And finally, we know that difficult history creates disequilibrium and that it, it, it puts that, I always tell our social studies educators, that little feeling in your stomach where you're like, okay, I'm, I'm taking a risk as a uh, teacher, but ultimately these are the stories that connect to our students and for our students. And so this, uh, is most cited in uh, um, Magdalena's work uh, in um, the conceptualization of difficult history. So that is what we centered the project around. And I think it was a great conversation that we had when we, when we uh, worked on um, thinking about the professional, how would this look like as we created professional development for teachers? So, 
So um, if you guys in the chat, um, and I think this will come up in the Q&A, is what thoughts and concerns do you have about teaching difficult topics in your classroom? So if we think about this conceptualization of difficult history, what, what are some thoughts, ideas, and as we go through this presentation and um, center our work in the question and answers, we will reflect on this question. So if you feel comfortable, just jot them down in the chat. Well, I'm going to turn it over to Allison as people are, are um, reflecting and feel, f uh, yes, can I defend my beliefs? Yes, absolutely. Yes. And as things pop up while we're working through the presentation, feel free to add them again. It's a great reference point for us that we can take a look at and help to frame the presentation. So, you know, the question is, why should we teach difficult issues and difficult events, um, both uh, historically, but then also in contemporary events? So the quote I have here is from Alicia Butler Arnold. I'm not going to read it to you, but you can certainly uh, read the quote. It's an excerpt from a recent article that she released in Social Education on why my students weren't surprised on January 6th. Um, Ms. Butler Arnold is actually a DCPS, uh, the District of Columbia uh, Public School System Social Studies teacher, as well uh, as a 2019 National History Teacher of the Year Award winner. Uh, and I've heard her speak before, she's phenomenal. And so she wrote a really interesting article about her philosophy on te teaching difficult issues, difficult history. And she made the connection to the events of January 6th and the insurrection. And you know what? What she focused on is that you know, in preparation for her um, uh, reflection with students the day after it happened, uh, she was thinking carefully about events uh, and. Um, key issues that she had already embedded in her course, but was really prepared uh, for it to be a really challenging day for her students as they processed it. And what she noted, which was really interesting, is that it wasn't as shocking for her students as she anticipated. And through the engagement of, of the students in discussion the day after January 6th, that she recognized that a key part of what allowed them to process it, not that it wasn't upsetting, it was incredibly upsetting, but it wasn't shocking. And that was because throughout her course, she embeds difficult history History, difficult issues, difficult topics, both again historically and uh, current events, that allowed her students to process it uh, as a means of, of what is present uh, in, in our American history as well as in contemporary America. And so they were prepared to, to process it. And it was not as shocking as it was for others who were not on a regular basis engaged with difficult topics. And so we recognize that the importance of embedding these in our instruction is that it allows us to challenge a dominant narrative, which it may not uh, always uh, holistically represent events in history. And so it's important to unearth those to provide varied perspectives um, and a balanced representation of events that it actually scaffolds the experience for students in being civically engaged in and participating in difficult conversations, um, both personally and professionally, uh, as uh, we have found that we um, have moved much of our conversation to an online platform and social media that at times students are, are disengaged from the emotional piece of it uh, and not always as thoughtful. Um, this is not just students, this is adults as well about what they share and how they engage with difficult issues. So scaffolding the experience in the classroom allows students to be better prepared for civic life um, and that we're providing the necessary skills, uh, what we call disciplinary skills to be able to do that um, in developing an argument in a position that is supported by evidence uh, through careful review uh, of sources uh, that they have uh, spent time evaluating. And so again, multiple reasons, uh, both in our work uh, with the past, but also our work with the present. Uh, and regardless of whether or not you teach history, uh, within any discipline, with any content area, there are difficult topics embedded, and so this is transferable. So we developed three lessons, uh, and we're going to give you an overview of, of those of those lessons uh, and give you an idea of how we frame them and how to prepare for them. So, Elaine, I think you were going to tackle the Harriet Tubman. Yeah, I, was, I thought it was the pearl, but it's OK. Um, so we the first lesson that we consider and I saw some great questions in the chat and I just wanted to kind of up with those, but people were worried about um, getting an emotional response for students. How do I not offend? 
Um, how do I not concern admin? It's funny because now I'm a principal. Um, and how can I be correct and honest without scaring? And so one of the things that these, these sort of questions came up when we considered our lesson. And um, one of the things that we commonly teach in elementary and middle school is the story of the Fairy Tubman. Obviously, obviously um, that is important um, to our work here in the state of Maryland. But uh, our inquiry question was, how does Harriet Tubman's potential involvement in the Combahee River Raid expand what mainstream textbooks reveal about her life? And so in this lesson, um, students compared historical sources to the contemporary interpretations of Harriet Tubman's life. And one of the things that we wanted to do was, again, refute this um, narrative of Harriet Tubman that was intimately connected to the Underground Railroad, but without without examining her larger, the larger intricacies of her life. Um, and that this idea that is central to difficult histories as well as to uh, my work in social studies is that many women's stories and um, contributions of women in color are particular, are missing or incomplete when taught to students. So when we you know, look at the, the arc of the American civil rights movement and we look at the impact of women, similar to Harriet Tubman, we might, we might briefly mention women, but we often don't teach them with uh, the complexity that uh, their, their life story deserves. And so uh, when we talked about difficult histories, one of the lessons that we examined was how do we enrich the narrative around Harriet Tubman? And so the, the teaching uh, strategy that we used, and, is, um, and somebody mentioned this, is uh, opening up the textbook strategy. So you start with kind of the traditional story that is told about Harriet Tubman in the textbook and students review that story. Um, and then, then you produce um, some primary source documents that begin to expand um, that narrative. And so by the end of the lesson, the students are able to rewrite what's in the textbook and, um, and provide a richer, more enriched narrative of the social studies. So that was the first kind of um, lesson that we did uh, in the, in this work. And Allison, feel free to jump in with any additional insights. No, you did a, a great overview on it. This is a topic that is really uh, engaging and interesting for the teachers that we have engaged with in the pre-service and that they were not familiar with the Kambahi River Raid and that this uh, particular uh, event in history actually resulted in 700 to 800 enslaved people on eight different rice um, forced work camps or plantations to uh, be liberated. And so it, it's a story that many are not familiar with uh, and so often uh, in awe that they haven't been and an example of how the textbooks do not always provide uh, a comprehensive narrative. And, and they're really able to, to look at the sources and evaluate her role in it and, and expanding again on this, this character that they thought they were um, very knowledgeable about and recognizing there was still much to learn. The second lesson was on brutality, uh, and this is one that you know is uh, sensitive in nature based on the primary sources that we worked with. Uh, but what we spent some time focusing on were two essential questions. One, why might it be important to know that white society was complicit in terror and brutality during and after slavery? Uh, and what many identify is, is that it was uh, enslavers who, who partook in the terror and brutality. And the purpose of this lesson is to really focus on the broader population's involvement, uh, at least through complicity, and that they were not actively um, uh, consistently seeking um, to resist uh, a practice that was uh, filled with uh, a great deal of violence and to recognize the broader involvement. And then we also spend some time looking at language in history and doing a careful critique of the way that textbooks represent these practices of uh, violence and brutality and the way that the primary uh, sources often uh, choose to dis describe it. And again, that power of language uh, and being thoughtful about the language that, that is used as we talk about uh, enslavement. So uh, again, one of the things that we note is that's really important to focus on working uh, with high schoolers in this. And when dealing with a difficult history, you have to know your students' readiness to engage uh, with, with the topic uh, and be mindful of where your students are uh, in terms of maturity. And that this lesson in particular, we felt was better suited to high schoolers versus Miller schoolers. And, and I saw one note in the chat, just identifying the concern about their students' readiness. And that's gonna vary from whether you're working with elementary, middle school, and high school and needing to be thoughtful about uh, the topics as well as the resources that you bring into the classroom. Uh, 
we um, Again, this is an, an example of where we do uh, an opening up the textbook. Uh, we have the students analyze the, the text, just like we did in the Harriet Tubman lesson, and then uh, look at carefully um, the language that is used there, as well as in the sources, to begin to think carefully about the language that they use uh, within the classroom, the way that they prepare their students to talk about uh, difficult history and their choice of language, and then using sources um, to, to rethink the understanding of it. And the last lesson is the pearl. And uh, when Allison speaks to age appropriate lessons, I'm a middle school principal. And this, is, this would be a lesson that I would work with my middle school students on. Um, and it speaks to um, uh, how and why was the pearl betrayed? And obviously we are, I am a huge fan of local histories and local histories are something that our students really connect to. Um, and so we are bringing uh, to a, a larger story about the, um, it's kind of like a mystery, um, about a, uh, a, a local story about resistance in DC around the, uh, the ship, the Pearl. And so this is one of those things where when we talk about difficult histories, it's, it's about finding something that's relevant for kids and at their interest level um, but it also talks again about what, why don't we know more about uh, these kind of local histories. So this lesson is about non-erasure. Um, how, how come stories of resistance are often overlooked? What consequence might this have? And again, this grounding our work in the social studies in these local histories. And so this was more of an inquiry lesson um, where we use source information to discover a new historical moment of resistance. And I think it's really important when we look at these um, difficult histories, this is for me often the most fun kind of lesson to teach is to give kids this idea of like, wow, I never knew this existed. I think that's one of the joys of being a history teacher is really introducing our students to new relevant and, um, and uh, important information. So when we were uh, the experts in this, on this team, I think this was the most enjoyable lesson for us to kind of review. So Allison, feel free. Yeah, and again, this is a really interesting story that most have not heard of. And this is actually the largest nonviolent escape attempt uh, that was organized by uh, African enslaved. Uh, so again, 77 uh, attempted uh, to seek freedom. And, and this is one that most are not familiar with. And it again, happened right in our backyard. And so uh, it what was really neat for us is last year in April, uh, the Washington Post covered uh, a, a DC based uh, group that is working to raise awareness awareness of the Pearl. And so uh, on the anniversary of the Pearl, an article was released about their efforts to broaden awareness uh, about what happened here and about the stories of, of those who were impacted. Uh, it was an unsuccessful attempt uh, to seek freedom uh, that they made it about two miles uh, up the Potomac only to find the winds were not in their favor and that they were uh, recaptured uh, by an armed posse and uh, they were, were returned and actually there is a, a, um, a memorial in Alexandria where two of the sisters uh, were held uh, when they were returned uh, to the to the DC area uh, but uh, that here is an example, too, of where we see white supremacy and racism embedded because after the recapturing of the, the Pearl and the return to DC, there was a three day riot by pro slavery um, advocates. And so again, making your students aware of, of the fact that racism is embedded in our history allows for greater context and understanding of the racism that exists today uh, and creating uh, a sense of uh, we will never be comfortable, but an ability to engage in discussion and reflection uh, with this difficult history and difficult issues as a matter of, of pedagogy. So Elena and I wanted to highlight best practices. Again, we shared the, the complex uh, preparation that went into developing these resources. And we know that not all classroom teachers have the ability to replicate that unless there is grant money to help support that. But there are lots of things that teachers can do uh, to prepare to tackle difficult topics, uh, difficult history, difficult conversations. So one is a strong encouragement to partake in regular professional development, recognizing if we have not prepared ourselves to talk about these difficult topics and 
and scaffold the experience for our students, we can sometimes do more harm than good. So we, this should be an ongoing practice. But as we engage with things we can think about in terms of classroom culture uh, is first and foremost, get to know your students. And you raised some concerns in the chat and Dr. Murray also pointed out about what she knew would be particularly good for middle school or high schoolers based on her classroom experience. Uh, but then that also can really vary based on where you teach, right? So you need to get to know your students individually as well as their families and as well as the communities and what uh, part of their story might, what they are bringing to the classroom from their family and community experiences and knowledge uh, that could influence uh, the way in which they engage uh, and interpret the difficult past, uh, the difficult topics. And so you need to be prepared for that so that you're walking into the lesson uh, thoughtfully and creating a space that allows uh, for comfort and for safety. We want to build in regular opportunities for discussion. You don't want to start with really complex, difficult issues. You want to build in the practice of discussion over time and then build up to more difficult uh, topics. And so that, again, can be smaller, you know, warm up and exit ticket experiences that build out uh, once the, uh, the norms for discussion and engagement in these topics have been built within uh, the classroom culture. And so that's why it's important to build a safe space uh, that norms for your classroom norms for discussion that those have been developed and have been practiced over time. And then also provide trigger warnings uh, that some of the topics that you will engage in in your, in your classroom are, are sensitive, uh, and so you want to make sure that you're giving fair warning when appropriate about some of the, the topics and so, for instance, our brutality lesson we know that some of the materials that are being used are sensitive and that uh, that students. Um, uh, are need to be aware if there is an emotional concern in terms of their emotional reaction. Uh, it's intellectually, we are all going to be uncomfortable, but but need to sometimes prepare for it. Elena, did you want to add anything? Sure. And I, I think in terms of our, um, our pedagogy and practice, the idea of, you know, primary sources driving your work, that there's not one, that there's not one singular text, that it's our role as educators to search for new stories. A lot of times teachers will say, oh, you know, I have this curriculum I teach. And we know that there, are, especially in the social studies curriculum, there are significant gaps. And it's important that we are active in our professional learning as Allison stated. Um, and that, that one of the things that you noticed in all of the case, cases that we presented to you that there's carefully um, crafted inquiry questions um, and that those questions drive the lesson. And I think it's really important and that uh, Dr. Gross and Allison um, modeled this when our professional learning was around how do we do peer reviews of lesson plans and materials and have discussions about what would be the mo most appropriate sources. And then I think the most, one of the most important concepts in, uh, difficult history is the idea around of um, multiple perspective taking that when we look at these these um, documents that we're trying to create uh, multiple ways for students to understand a particular event and then finally uh, social studies educators are not fans of role plays <laughs> they they oftentimes put students in uncomfortable positions and there's many more ways that students can access a particular event also I didn't know if you had any more comments no no, thanks, Elena. So knowing that, um, there are a variety of resources we want to share. Obviously, our website on teaching uh, the difficult past using primary sources. But as well, we have a list of other materials that we will drop into the chat that includes um, resources that we have on our website. Uh, the 1619 uh, project, uh, when we looked at the 400 anniversary of enslavement coming to the United States, uh, to our colonies. Uh, Enslaved.org is actually a University of Maryland project with Michigan uh, that is developing resources. We have um, putting movement back into the civil rights teaching, which uh, Dr. Murray referenced earlier, as well as her book, of course. There's a variety of um, uh, resources available that are not specific to history, but difficult topics in general that can be accessed on the Library of Congress website and the Zen Education Project, which is a DC based group. And then we encourage you to go to the Learning for Justice website as well, which is very focused on uh, embedding the critical backs, uh, the critical practices uh, in learning for justice uh, that again, there's some professional development and teacher resources there. 
And I also want to highlight, there's a couple articles we mentioned here, but Bowie State is doing a difficult dialogue play uh, that uh, is going to be on 9 um, September 30th. So I dropped in the RSVP for this. It, it sounds very interesting uh, and a great opportunity, again, to engage in difficult conversations not, that's not specific to history, but a broader context for many of you. And so as we close, we just wanted you all to be able to reflect on something that um, uh, was in the book, The Case for Reparations. And so we must imagine a new country by which I mean the full acceptance of our collective biography and its consequences. The price we must pay to see ourselves squarely. What I'm talking about is more than a recompense for past injustice. What I'm talking about is a national reckoning that would lead to a spiritual renewal. So again, here we are at Ed Turp Dialogues. Uh, I think it's important as educators, we really reflect and, um, and be inspired to teach this difficult work because I think it's the most necessary work for our students and our communities. So thank you again for uh, being active listeners in our presentation. And I don't know if you have any more things to say, Allison. No, thank you. We appreciate the opportunity. So as we get set up, we'll get Dr. Bynum prepared and her materials together. And we will go straight into her presentation before our Q&A. So I think Kurt has her materials. I have a, um, he's, oh, he's yeah. gonna let me, Great. he's gonna let me present, um, <laughs> which oh. I'm very pleased by. <laughs> okay, fantastic. So you've got screen sharing, you can move right into that? Yeah. And, okay, fantastic. Um, and then I did um, prepare two handouts. I was going to try to drop the, um, up upload them into the chat, but I, I for some reason it's not working. Um, uh, so I'll ask Kurt to try to do that because he have more, may have more privileges than I do for that. But um, thank you so much for this invitation. Um, I learned uh, so much from that. I was like, I need to get on this mailing list. So, <laughs> so that was absolutely delightful. Um, I'm going to be um, talking about uh, some of my undergraduate teaching um, uh, on uh, these issues um, at, at the um, undergraduate level, but I'm also going to share a little bit about my research. So as um, Dr. Fries Britt mentioned, I am a clinical psychologist and what I've spent the last um, 20 years studying is how Black parents um, prepare their kids to cope with racism and discrimination and how do they um, shield them uh, um, when these realities that um, have really flared up in some really ugly and nasty ways in the last five years in particular, um, how do you help uh, um, raise and guide a Black child um, uh, through these times? And so I'll, um, so I've called this talk Bringing Race into the Room because that's um, uh, what a lot of my career has been about, bring it into the classroom and bring it into the therapy room as well. And so I'll begin by um, reviewing some of the challenges that Black parents um, uh, and parents who are raising Black children uh, encounter. So, um, and I'm talking to educators here, it's, it's nice to be preaching to the choir. We know that there are developmental tasks that we want to see our young people accomplish. And one of those um, has to be um, uh, forming a positive identity, a positive sense of self. And that's a challenge in a country where Black people continue to be um, devalued. And so kids need to learn to cope with racism, discrimination. And then because the country remains so segregated, they've got to learn to navigate um, uh, their own cultural spaces as well as mainstream cultural spaces because oftentimes that's where the resources are. And so this is just um, a screenshot of what I've been doing in um, uh, testing uh, for the last 20 years is a task that um, I'm calling the racial socialization observational task and coding system. Racial socialization is the keyword um, uh, under which my research fall, fall, falls. And this is a screenshot from the very first family that I interviewed, goodness, back in 2002 or three when I uh, began developing this work. And um, it's essentially a parenting dilemma. Um, how do you handle it as a parent and as a family when your kid comes home and says something like, mom, someone called me the N-word. What does that mean? 
or um, I don't think my, my teacher is treating me very fairly. Um, and I'm not sure what that's about. And so I came up with five different um, uh, paragraph long short stories in which I uh, played them um, on audio tape um, for the families. And I developed a system to understand how those discussions um, unfolded. And uh, it's been a long time coming. This is very labor intensive work, but um, it seems to have finally met the moment. And um, uh, these are some of the key areas that um, have emerged from my observing live conversations between uh, 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 parents, fathers and uh, mothers um, and their adolescent uh, kids. And so what we find is that their um, communication tends to fall in three different categories. Um, they are uh, reactions to the event, um, which essentially consists of how are they making sense of what happened do they recognize some of these things as being um, uh, involving racism or not? Um, I won't have time to go into the ent entire system, but the second category deals with the strategies that the parents communicate to the kids. Uh, you all as teachers um, have had a number of these conversations um, in a variety of con contexts, not just race, where parents will come and talk to um, the teacher, talk to the coach. Um, try to get an understanding of what's going on. They will give direct suggestions to their kids about how to solve these dilemmas and how to maintain uh, their emotions in the context of racial discrimination. And then what I also observed are specific strategies that the kids themselves would generate. And um, what we've essentially been able to find is that parents who do more of these discussions and who have positive relationships with their kids have kids who are better adjusted. And so um, contrary to the narrative that's been out there for a long time, which is that it's best to be colorblind, that for black families, it's best to actually be talking about these um, things, that um, these strategies are reflective of a good relationship with kids. And I would say as a corollary to that, for um, white parents and other parents of color, having an active um, set of discussions around racial issues um, even if you don't know the answers, like being detectives and going and figuring those things out, because kids can understand race in their own way from as early as three years of age. It may still be a three-year-old's notion, but they can pick up on inequities in society even before they really understand what the roots are. And so that we as parents um, should not be shying away from that. And some of the um, headlines in terms of what parents should be um, uh, trying to convey um, uh, in the midst of also helping kids to deal with some of these difficult realities is how actually awesome it is to be Black. Um, <laughs> we don't really talk about that a whole lot. There's a lot of focus on um, the struggle um, and the struggle is real. That's where these phrases they come from. Um, but yet being Black is actually a lot of fun. Um, black culture is uh, enormously creative. And um, uh, there is this new concept that's getting a lot of currency now called Black Joy. Um, uh, it's been around for I don't know how long, but it's a thing now um, that uh, re researchers and scholars are trying to nail down as well as um, uh, people who are in the creative arts are also talking about and really linking that sense of identity to um, the history of, of Black culture um, in the United States and, and, and the civil rights movement so on and so forth. And so, um, because sometimes kids can't understand what's happening, but once they are informed of the history, then they don't personalize some of these um, harsh and negative and dehumanizing events that are happening to them. Okay. And as already has been um, addressed this evening, which I, I figured it was probably going to come up is that I'm sure everyone who is um, present in this session tonight is aware that the textbooks um, don't necessarily give us the full narrative and that it really depends on what part of the country um, you're teaching in, what's actually approved, even though they're coming from the very same publisher. Um, when I show this uh, to my students um, here on campus, many of them are not aware of these um, uh, slanted narratives that can uh, be present in their textbooks. And so I, I presented them that, and I'm, I'm actually doing a lot of, of, of backfilling of information because I know that depending on where um, they're from, they may not have gotten a deep dive um, that uh, the other panelists were talking about this evening. So the name of the course that um, I designed for the Honors College is part of a new fellowship um, uh, called University 
faculty fellows. Um, it's called Identity Places and Spaces. And someone had uh, mentioned in the chat um, concerns about uh, offending um, either their students or other members, parents and other members of the community. I've been watching all the news about the banning of critical race theory and all the, the disinformation around it. And I will confess when I began developing this course, I was also fearful. Um, and um, I purposely uh, titled the course in a way so that it would be non-controversial, um, but the course description reflects all of the things uh, um, uh, that I think are important. I just don't want to be harassed by um, anyone who uh, would misunderstand what it is that I'm trying to do. But this is an I-series course, um, and uh, I-series courses on campus um, cannot have a right or wrong answer. And so I really wrestle with, well, the whole idea that oppression is bad, like that's the answer. Like, <laughs> so I had to um, really think that through and it came up with the question, am I privileged? And so this is an intersectionality course, which is a component of critical race theory. And this semester, because the controversy has bubbled up even more, that I talked to them about the myths around teaching critical race theory and that one, that it will teach white people to hate themselves and that it will teach um, people to hate the United States. And I usually will um, use myself in those spaces. Um, that's pretty common for um, how I approach teaching as a psychologist is I'll say, well, I'm American, I'm black and I do not hate the country. I said, I love being American. I'm just focused on these issues here, you know? And then I talked to them about that. And then we, we started to make our way into the lessons and I'll do check-ins. Does anybody hate themselves yet? You know, and they'll kind of laugh. And so then we're able to move on. So with an intersectionality course, there are um, many different forms of oppression you can organize the course around. Mine is, is organized mostly around race and racism. Um, but we generally take a topic a week after we do some foundational issues and uh, do a deep dive on ableism, uh, um, heterosexism, so on and so forth. And so um, I'm using conventional teaching methods, but I'm also very intentional about um, using exercises that foster self-reflection and empathy. And what I tell my students, because I'm, I'm teaching in the honors college, is I said, you are going to be um, in positions of power. And so it's really important that you understand the implications of that um, for your coworkers, for the people you're supervising, for the organizations that you work for. Um, I model that self-disclosure um, at the top of the class um, to sort of uh, normalize the fact that we're all on a growth process, even though I may be in a different place than them. And then um, we begin each semester uh, with assistance from good old Teaching, Learning and Technology Center here on campus with um, classroom generated guidelines um, that come from the ground up that will foster meaningful and thoughtful um, and civil discussion. And so this framework that I use comes from a clinical psychologist who wrote a book on this, on um, addressing um, diversity issues in psychotherapy, but I've used it um, uh, in all kinds of other courses, um, including one that I teach on black families. And we deal with um, the isms as represented by these different um, identity uh, demographic uh, groups here. And so we use the language of dominant identity, non-dominant or not dominant group, non-dominant group here. And so you can see in the acronym, here's the addressing sort of embedded in those group um, titles there. And so at every intersection, um, listed, unlisted, society fosters the maintenance of privilege and marginalization. Um, our current historical moment of upheaval and transformation reflects these realities because of the frustration of non-dominant groups with the status quo. And then also the role of the internet um, and how that has fostered the visibility of non-dominant group members as well. And that traditional gatekeepers um, uh, for media have uh, much less influence than in the past. And so we talk about that um, in, in this present moment. And so with the assignment, um, each week, I've taught this class um, two times. This is my third time. Next semester will be my fourth and final time uh, on my fellowship. But every um, semester, I begin the course with an in-class reflection. Um, first, the first semester, the reflection was first COVID-19, then George Floyd. And so uh, these are students who were mostly freshmen coming onto the campus virtually for the first time and just trying to get the issues down on the page um, 
Then we had the insurrection. So I added the insurrection as a third topical one for spring. And then this semester, the in-class reflection was on the new normal and all of the realities that we're dealing with in this um, present moment. Um, it's highly discussion intensive. Um, yesterday I taught, there was no lecture. It was discussion from top to bottom after a few prompts. Um, I use film clips, uh, do some lecture to make sure that there's some common foundational language. But each week they submit weekly journals, which is to get at the self-reflection. And then the final unit is on allyship. And then the um, about 15 groups, because I have 60 students, um, there's usually 15 capstone presentations on two intersections of their choice. And some of those have just been absolutely amazing. And so what I would close with this evening um, is remembering that this is lifelong work, that for all the categories on the addressing framework that I showed, I have evolved as an instructor. Um, we did, and as, a, as a, um, uh, um, a researcher and as a human being and as a clinician, we did two years of training before um, this course uh, was introduced to our students. And I have moved along the addressing framework. And so this, I talked with my students about that. And so I think too, when we're talking about those, those difficult conversations, it's particularly for young people, um, allowing them to acknowledge that where they are, because sometimes when those blinders are off, it's a bit of an earthquake for them. Um, I've, I've mentored some of those students um, before. And so just being prepared to hold space for them and to let them know um, that they don't have to figure it out all at once. That's what I see a lot with the undergraduates is that they're like, if silence is violence, what do I do? And I was like, well, first just learn. And then we'll say so we're gonna take 15 weeks and we're gonna start the process. So I thank you so much for your time. I really do appreciate your um, uh, uh, company this evening. Wow, that was, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just get us moving. Let me just say to the panelists, that was just an amazing host of information that just cuts across so much of what we've been trying to build out in some of the professional development work. And I, I know I was looking in the chat space, some great questions are there, but let me try to start us. And, and I know we have a little bit of a tight time, but I want to just focus in on a couple quick questions. And I'm going to ask my colleague to look at the chat space. But I noticed across all of your work really is, and you all already did this. And so I'm asking you to distill a little bit you know, it came up in the first presentation about um, necessary skills. And so my question is, can each of you all share, what would you take, and it's a lot in your presentation, what would you distill out of that for the audience that they could potentially apply directly in their work as key um, takeaways of how particularly um, what they can walk away from your presentation to help build those necessary skills, whether it's in their students or in themselves. Um, would you just still, and you, again, you gave a lot of it in your presentations, but what would be some key takeaways just to start us off that you would identify in your own work, um, specifically that you'd give to the audience to say, uh, out of everything I've shared, here's one or two, three things that I think are important for us to do. Whoever wants to kind of go first. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you again, Mia. That was, that was amazing. And I do think all of our panels are definitely speaking to each other. Um, so I would say that for me in all this work, the first thing is this ability to be critically um, reflective and critically conscious about your, your space in uh, the journey, because I feel like a lot of times teachers are hesitant to sort of take on these, this kind of work because they're nervous. And I think when you feel that feeling of being nervous, the one thing you have to begin is to say is like, why am I nervous? Like, what, right. what am I holding back um, about my own racial identity journey? And I think that that all of this work is centered on that that question. That if I if I am unable to tell my story and reflect mm -hmm. on how I got to this point, my students can mm -hmm. sense that this is not authentic. Um, this is not authentic for uh, them to to take these risks themselves. Because what you're trying to create is a classroom where the the you're modeling intellectual risk taking for students and, and so i think that's i think that would be my first thing that it, have i done my work and then how can i model that so my students uh, my students feel comfortable in the classroom love that 
building off of that, uh, that what Dr. Murray talked about was, you know, that we have to be comfortable with the discomfort. Uh, the reality is this is intellectually uncomfortable. That's why it's difficult. And so, uh, again, uh, you know, Elena talking about sharing that personal experience is, is really important and to allow students to, to know that it's okay to be uncomfortable, that, that I acknowledge that as a white woman that uh, I, I feel at times uncomfortable leading and facilitating conversations and developing materials on enslavement, but I also know and recognize that it's very important for all members of society to be part of this conversation and so uh, that you have to allow students to feel uncomfortable and for you to uh, also uh, articulate your, your discomfort, but the necessity of doing it for the development of um, uh, civic skills that are important in the long run. Uh, but then also recognizing that professional development and the process is ongoing and uh, Dr. Smith Bynum referred to that that this is lifelong work and so that requires that we are constantly engaged in professional development on these topics, uh, because it is uh, important that we're doing that ongoing self reflection about who we are in order to shape and influence the work that we do with students uh, and, and to keep that at the forefront of our work. And what I would share, I've, I've included this, um, let me turn my background oh, okay. off. My son may wander into the background, so I have to keep my virtual backgrounds up. But this book here, um, which some of you may be familiar with, um, is just an excellent resource. I um, did a screenshot of it in the back of one of my handouts. And um, uh, it's got a reading companions to it too, but that may or may not work for K through 12. I think, it, I think you'll have to judge um, your student uh, body uh, to make sure if it, it makes sense for them. But it's got, a, it's just chock full of all kinds of practical teaching tips on how to organize a lesson plan. So you bring your content expertise as the, as the, as the instructor, but then how do you deliver it in a way that um, is the best of, of, of instructional skills and, and frameworks for thinking about what the endpoint will be? And so this, I discovered this by accident in my teaching prep for my course, and um, uh, it's, it's worth every um, dime. And then I think this piece too, um, like I use a lot of humor in my teaching. I've discovered during the um, pandemic that I'm an extrovert, that I'm not an introvert. <laughs> so um, I uh, sort of lean into that. And even when we're talking about different topics, um, difficult topics that I, um, I, I sort of forecast it with the way I bring it in. And then um, I'll either use my Southern accent or I'll use black vernacular um, directly because the students know that I'm black. And so I'll say, you know what, I'm black, you know, and I will, you know, and that way they'll laugh and so I was like, okay, now we can get down to business. Um, and my son, he actually has a, um, a white black history teacher right now. And she named it on the first day. I know while you all are wondering what is a white woman doing teaching black history. So, so rather than trying to act like the issues aren't there, just go towards them. And if your style is to be more humorous, um, be more humorous. If not, um, you know, bringing that empathy, that calm presence, um, which is, uh, um, uh, a different kind of teaching style from mine, but one that it certainly can be um, uh, as equally as effective. I love that across your answers was the uh, being authentic and really owning where we are and it, and also re uh, modeling for folks that none of us have this perfect. We're all, and I love the way um, Dr. Bonham, you ended. I mean, we're all, we're just continually needing to grow and develop and we're all experiencing that challenge. So the more authentic we are engaged that it, it really does open people up to feel safe about doing the work that they need to do. As I cue my colleague up to get ready to get a question in the chat space, let me ask one other. And um, and I know there's a lot in the chat space, so we'll go to the chat space the rest of the time. But you know, it's interesting if even if you do all the things that you all said about norming the the room, getting people prepared, doing all the stuff that you need to do, and even saying to them that there might be triggers in this work, can can you all share how do you handle? If things do it with all that preparatory work, something happens in the classroom, the engagement and the intensity is there and it's and you're finding yourself now needing to manage that. What insights would you give to folks about what you've learned and what you've done to be in the middle of having to deal with when the emotions get too high or someone is having a reaction to the difficult topics that you're teaching about? I think build that in at the beginning of the year, at the beginning of the unit. So 
with for my students, and, the, and again, this is Teaching, Learning, and Technology Center, or TLTC. I can't claim this is a MIA original. Have you need an off ramp, like a safe word, or we're gonna take a timeout, like like you 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 know as an instructor, you're constantly monitoring like the 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 temperature of the discussion, and so if you feel it's getting too hot or if someone's getting really emotional. You let them know at the top of the unit or the class, I'm not, I'm going to take care of you. And so if it's going to get too hot um, or if it does, we, we're going to have an off ramp, you know, and then are we just going to allow it to breathe and let's take some space for this. And so the students, if they trust that you're going to care for them, they will, they will follow you. Um, provided that you're not teaching in a, in a context where these topics are so controversial that you will end up on social media or the news or something like that. But that, that's what I would suggest is that assume that it will happen and then work, a, have a, um, an off ramp for the students so that they understand that mm -hmm. you're going to take care of, of them in the process. Dr. Murray and Ms. Yeah, so there was a there's a there was a there was a lot going on in that question. And I think that for me, um I feel like when when we're having to kind of manage uh you know people's emotions um in these conversations, I I feel like that's why um again, I kind of fall to that piece of when you're facilitating these conversations, you have to have done some of your own work mm -hmm. because people are going to come at you um, with a lot of different questions. And I don't take it personally. You know, it's, it's where people, and I always think of like, where are people in the arc of their own identity journeys? Because I think a lot of teaching difficult history is about letting go of the past. And, and so if you have been um, a white person in the United States, part of your past you have to let go of that that moment where you feel that you know it was something that maybe you were proud of if you have that in that particular part of your past and so i've learned that in these conversations people are grieving so sometimes i just let them tell their story and and give them a space to begin to let go because you know this was something that you know might have been important to their narrative as a person and so they're responding to you when you're you're kind of opening up to the conversation because that, that's a moment they're having. And it's not really personal to, to me um, as, a, as, a, um, as a teacher or facilitator. And I also feel like I always liken it, and it's funny because it's raining outside right now, to being in a thunderstorm. Like there might be a moment where people are coming at you pretty hard. And I'm just like, okay, I'm in a thunderstorm right now. This person is where they are. And I'm just going to kind of listen to where they are and just let it rain. And then people begin to move forward. Because I think a lot of times, you can't, you have to, you have to listen. You have to, in some ways, validate that this was their experience. And although I disagree with it, this is the, this is the experience they're coming to this particular moment in. So I try not to take it personally. And I ask a lot of questions. I think that when you, I think people have to separate how they feel about a topic to your role as the facilitator of a discussion, of a class, of a moment. So a lot of times, I've noticed inexperienced folks around this equity issue, they're gonna insert their opinions. And for me, I ask a lot of questions. I wanna to get to the bottom of what that person's thinking is and it's not personal, right? And so as much as I might completely disagree with this person and I, as a school principal during the January 6th insurrection riots, I had a parent who came at me very strongly about what we're teaching in um, our school. And I just had to ask him some questions to get him to begin to talk himself into a, a better place. So I, I think it's, I think as we facilitate these difficult um, history conversations, it's, it's really thinking about where are people on their own journey and having some empathy and some sympathy for that. And then there was one question in the chat I wanted to address about uh, the, speaking about young learners. And I wanna take folks back to the um, discussion around the pearl because I think for our younger learners, it's taking a story that they might not have ever heard and having them participate in a discovery process or taking a figure that they've learned about and kids come in with a lot of schema. So for example, I always say, especially when you're looking 
at the civil rights movement. They know about Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, Harry Tubman immediately. They haven't even stepped foot in a school. They might have seen it on cartoons. They might have seen it in their local church. They know who those people are. So our job as educators around teaching difficult history is to give people a more complete picture. So I always share with people, you know, Rosa Parks was, how old was Rosa Parks? You know, the kids are like, she was a hundred years old. And you always explain to them, no, she was 42 and right. Dr. Murray is 46. So who's old, right? Like getting them to understand mm -hmm. just by thinking about their age, how we have mythologized these people. Cause all the kids are like, she's old and elder. I'm like, well, maybe 40 feels really old to you, but it's not old to me. And so then they start to have that conversation. So I want to, uh, direct uh, that for our young, our, our teachers or younger learners, because I saw that in the chat. Yeah, appreciate that. Allison, I didn't know if you wanted to, to, to um, weigh in at all on that, but I'm going to turn it over to Tiki. I see lots of great questions. Maybe we can get a couple in in the last couple minutes before we turn over to our to our president. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, Allison, did you want to add something? To the no, question? I totally agree. It's a wonderful time to transition. Um, so I saw a lot of things going on in the chat, but one thing I would be very interested to know from uh, today's panelists is how do you practice self-care in this work? Um, a lot of times we don't think of ourselves uh, and our own needs uh, or, or where our tolerance or meter is or where we are in the, the storm uh, to a panelist's point. So could you give us any tips about how to practice self-care and how you stay connected to the work when things are very difficult? Mm -hmm. I'll take a stab at that. Um... If I know I'm going to teach a tough unit, one particularly when I'm covering the ones on race and there's a lot of stuff happening in the news, sometimes I, I and I'm a news junkie, so let me put mm. that up front. I will sometimes check out a bit more on the play-by-play -play of it. So I've got the reserves mm. to manage it in the classroom. So, um, uh, and then I think you do have to, you have to do all the things you gotta, you gotta exercise. You've got to make sure you take your dime downtime in the course of a given week or month. And then I think what's also really helpful is having a community of other, um, colleagues who are engaged in the work so that you can provide that emotional support to one another. Um, but I try to make, I'm always try to pay attention to how much I have in reserve so that I can stay centered when um, I'm teaching uh, a topic. I'll share a quick anecdote. I was doing a unit on black uh, feminism and I started with a clip from the Harriet Tubman movie. So it was so nice to hear the um, other panelists talk about Harriet Tubman. And I'm teaching my heart out. And a young person put it in the chat, how much of this stuff should we believe? <laughs> and so, and I took that to mean, they think I'm teaching propaganda, you know? And so my first instinct was to go back and to, and I, I came back the next week and I put it in the chat. I said, I, I went, I threw out the unit out and I said, how much of this should you believe mm -hmm. and let the work come up from the students? And so I had to step back and get that reflection. If I were, my reserves were shallow, mm -hmm. I would have missed the moment. And the students said that was one of the best classes where we just, unpack like how do you critically evaluate information yeah I, I would build on that the collaboration piece is so key right creating community when you're both emotionally and then pragmatically and physically in the development of resources that that working with the team working with the plc uh, on a grade level plc and developing resources uh, and that collaborating, and that's why Dr. Murray and I always enjoy presenting together because there's a collaborative aspect of it um, and a friendship that that has you know that exists that allows us to you know to enjoy doing the difficult work together. Uh, the second piece that and we give this advice to interns all the time is is to pace yourself, which I think uh, speaks to what Dr. Bynum was referring to as well. That uh, you do not need to tackle difficult issues in every single lesson that they're doing in their classroom, but you need to be aware constantly about connections that can be made. Uh, and also developing more comprehensive lessons over time. And so recognizing that this is, again, a, a journey. And so you, you pace yourself over time and looking for uh, ongoing connections and building resources uh, over the course of your career, constantly adding to them, revising them, and updating them. 
Well, I know we're near the end, but Dr. Murray, I know you want to get some wisdom in on how you take care of yourself before we try to officially close out. And I turn this over to our, our fearless leader here, but I was completely silent on that because I'm a principal in the middle of a pandemic. <laughs> so you're not taking good care of yourself. Oh. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> and so um, I'm just prayerful that by April, we we are not contracting, contact tracing in public schools. That's my prayer. Oh. So it's so good. Sure. But I will say that Allison reached out to me with a very kind note, just through the mail. I got it. So I think a way of the to really practice self-care is to think of your friends who might be really struggling right now. And it, I, it meant a lot to me to get a note from her, like what, what, some random note. Like I looked and I was like, oh my God, it's like on my desk because I know people care because right now I can, I think it can feel very isolating in, in this work. Well, you know, when I hear you say that, let me just say, and I'm gonna turn it over to Barbara to close out. Just do micro one minutes for yourself. You, you as Principal, you still got to have a micro one minute. I know we're running out of time, so I'm going to turn this over to um, Barbara Freelander, our fearless president of the association, to bring us home and close us out with some wisdom and final words. Thank you so much. I cannot tell you how much I appreciate this last hour. Um, you know, in my job in MCPS, I coach first year teachers. Um, some want to be on this journey and learn, and some recently students have been calling out their biases, and now they need more information, and that is in the elementary. So those of you that are asking how do we do elementary, kids know it, and they're starting to call it out to their teacher. So it um, wow. puts them on the journey. <laughs> um, and I'll also say I've been on this equity and race uh, learning journey for a while now, but I just took three pages of notes. So there's always more to learn, and I appreciate you so much being here today, um, especially those of you that showed up to learn today. Um, to piggyback on uh, Dr. Mary, it's it's an opening of school like no other. People are exhausted. We've been dealing with things we've never had to deal with, and yet you came today to do your own professional learning, and we really value you being here we appreciate you be here and i think you should reward yourself for spending the last hour learning and taking care of your own professional learning so on that note you can continue to learn with us throughout the year but on november 9th there's ed talks where you have six faculty members so today you got to hear from two you'll get six of faculty members that are going to talk about their research at ed talks it's on zoom or in person so if you miss going to campus, sign up and come. If you just need to log in because you're also running schools and, and running from place to place, just zoom on in. We really, really want to see you. And then I put a link into the Alumni Association. Um, any any um, one that members would like to join, please, it goes towards scholarships to students that want to become teachers. So, and we need them. We know there's a teacher shortage. So. Uh, join the alumni and please come join us at Terrapin Ed Talks. Thank you. This is awesome. Thank you. Thank Bye you all. for coming. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, connect with us. Thank you for coming. So this will end our formal program. Thank you all very much for joining us and uh, we look forward to seeing you soon. Take care. And everybody, I just, uh, just a great job. Thank you all so much. I literally, I had three pages of notes. I wasn't lying. I can't see it because of my background, but. Yeah. You know, it just reminded me, though, the richness of these topics, like, wow, you cannot even, like, there was a lot in both presentations. I was sitting there thinking, and some really good points, just amazing. Like, we just never have enough time to get them all, to get it all out. That was just wonderful. Really appreciate it. Well, thank you. I, I learned a lot. Um, thank you so much for inviting me, and it's nice to meet everyone. I, I saw a few familiar names in the attendee list as well, so which is awesome also kind of cool but thank you so much for the invitation and best of luck everyone thank yeah, you it was wonderful thank to meet you mia thank you for inviting us thank you, thank you, thank you everybody. Everybody. take care kurt are you closing out
Oh my I, gosh, you guys did amazing. Yes, they they was, were so perfect. They were. That was a great way to end that session from last year.